Hello, Angie Poland. Hello. Great. My name is Greg, and I'm a principal engineer at Logula. And you know, I'm gonna tell you tell you about the hexagon architecture. In my free time, I'm making tooling to make developers more, you know, perform better. And I'm also doing trainings and consulting. Let me tell you a little bit of a story. So this is how usually our relationship with a client start. Logula, we got the problem. You know, there is a bit of an affair there, and as with every affair, there are two sides of the story. The first side are the business people, and the other ones are the developers. So let's start with the business. What typically the business says on our sessions? Well, they say things like estimates are very high, even for the simple task. And the developer part of me thinks like, how dare you question my estimates, right? Maybe do it yourself then. <laughs> OK, but to be honest, we listen to them, and then we say to the next step, and they say, you know, developers, when they actually get into something, it's really slow to deliver things. And then we're like, yeah, we, we heard that before. And then you know what? It's even worse, because once we get it into the production, things crash. So they are very surprised. They say, you know, we hire these very qualified people, and we have those problems. How is that possible? Then we go to the developers and we ask them, hey developers, how are you doing? And they say, great, we have an Angular 14, and we have an NX monorepo running, and we even have tons of libraries. Then they say we have 90% code coverage. Hello? Okay, sorry. And then they will say, uh, we have a storybook and UI components. Nothing could be better, right? Then you get to down and you see two different scenarios, right? The business talks about one thing, and these guys talk about something totally different. And then we dive a little bit deeper. And then we think, okay, what is the problem, right? Developers should be doing the good thing, so what is the problem? Well, the problem is it's not really what you are doing or what you're bragging about, it's actually how you do those things. And this is very, very important. So let's see how a setup like this can be messed up. So let's have a look at this. So this is a typical thing called um, you know, uh, audit. We do the audit for the companies. And then the colors actually represents different types of classes and interfaces in your code base. So for example, the blue ones will represent um, will represent the services, the red ones will represent uh, states, the green one will represent UI layer like components and directives, and then you have this little cyan ball right there, and it's actually representing a module. So what does this tell me about it? Is that the module, it's not very modular setup here. Like everything is connected and there is one single module. So not the best setup. Okay, and the size also does matter. So we have a big and smaller circles. And the bigger the circle, it means the more lines of code are there. So we have two little friends here who need a little bit more to actually um, something might, a little bit more love to, to, to be refactored to smaller pieces. And then, just like in life, relationships also do matter. So this is a cohesion. And we have things like, you know, everything is connected and, you know, it's pretty much a mess. And this is within one single library. And then you go further and you see the yellow ones, which are the uh, dots representing the external dependency to this library. So this is all the dependencies to other libraries or other classes in other libraries in the same monorepo. So you see, sure, we have every nice setup, but if it looks like this, you know what's happening, right? The next thing, this, this is my favorite slide. We all seen this, right? And you see, it doesn't even fit on the screen. Um, and I have 50 inch of skin at home, it didn't fit still. Um, and then, you know what, what I learned from these graphs? That developers are very creative how to avoid circular dependencies. Okay, there we go. So let's get back to what the developers said. We have Angular 14. So what? I mean, your code base looks like it looks. We have NX monorepo, and your dev graph looks like it looks. We have 90% code coverage, but you still get bugs. We have storybook and UI components, but it's not reusable, because you have 50 inputs in there. And you don't use uh, content projection. 
Okay, so this has been bugging me for some time. Why current architectures do not work? Because, you see, you could be using state management system and you could be using even simple architectures and whatever it is, but it really doesn't work. And I've been thinking about it. It doesn't work because our code base is scale very fast and we don't have time to refactor it along the way. So I'm going to show you a little bit of alternatives. Okay, before we get to the architecture overview, let's have a look at the applications today. So it's pretty complex. So what we have is the gray box represents the architectures, and then we have a users with the browsers, and the browsers are pretty sophisticated pieces of software, and they communicate with our application. Then we might also have events, you know, like a web sockets, PWAs, you know, whatever, that actually allows us to, you know, invoke functionalities in a synchronous manner. Then we also have APIs, internal ones, external ones, security, you know, you name it. We have to connect with it. Then we also have storages. You know, you have your storages in your browser, like in the memory and so on. It's pretty complex too. And then we have events as well, because we want to notify the outside world about what has happened in our library. Okay, let's talk about the principles of hexagonal architecture. I'm going to tell you three things, three basic things, and you'll be pretty much ready to go. Okay, hexagonal architecture consists of three things. First, in the middle, is something called core. Then we will have a ports, and ports come in two different flavors, in primary ports and secondary ports. And then we will have adapters, and then we have a primary adapters and secondary adapters. That's it. That's all you have to know about the hexagonal architecture. But obviously we work with it for over a year now, so I can give you some more detail. So core is really an application layer. It's a logic where you have an application and business logic, and it's all encapsulated in this little hexagon. Then the primary adapters is an abstraction. We like to use injection tokens and interfaces, but you might be using abstract classes as well. But in general, it's something that connects the primary adapter and the core. Then you have a secondary adapter, which is pretty much the same. It connects the core and the secondary adapter. Then we have a primary adapter, which is like the UI layer, something that you know, renders the data, all this optimization talks, you heard about it. That happens in the primary adapter. And then we have a secondary adapter that connects with the outside world, so with the API storages and sends events out. And that's it. That's all you have to know. So let me talk a little bit more. Let's go a little bit deeper. You're still open, right? Okay. So let's go a little bit deeper and talk about our version of the implementation that we actually developed. So it looks like this. Let's go one by one. OK. So a user can interact with stuff you already know, with components, directives, guards, and resolvers. And then the events can interact with the event listener. These are the primary adapters. This is how you actually invoke functionality in your application. Then these components can only talk through a two types of port, command port and query port. Command port is responsible to dispatching the data. Query port is responsible, you can subscribe to it and receive new stream of data, which is optimized for your components, for example. Then the state will implement that command port, so it will actually have those methods, and whenever it's invoked, it can do the logic. And then when it's finishing processing the logic, it will push the data back to you in a query port. Then we will have, we need to get the data from somewhere, right? So we we're going to use something called a DTO port. A DTO port will be injected inside the state. And then the same DTO port is going to get implemented in a service. It could be HTTP service, it could be GraphQL service, Firebase service, you, you name it. The whole point is that the service is connected with the APIs. Then the state can also want, might want to persist its state, right? So it needs to use something called a context port. And then context port is going to be implemented by a storage. It could be in memory storage, it could be index DB storage, local storage, mm, cookie storage, whatever you want to use. 
And then we're going to have an event port, something that dispatching information outside, something that has happened in my lifecycle of my application. And that's going to be implemented by the event dispatcher, and that's going to connect with the event bus. OK, that's our implementation about it. We're slowly getting into it. Let's get a little bit deeper. I'm going to show you on a real life example. So here we go. We have a page called shopping cart. And then the naive way would be to just stash everything inside. But you know, it's not really scalable. It's fine if you do just the POC to impress your boss. Normally, it's not really, it's not really scalable. Because the business comes in and says, you know what? We didn't decide yet whether the summary should stay on the same page or maybe be shown in a model or shown in a later part of the flow. So I don't want you to keep it like together. So we know we need to decouple these two things. So when I look at it, I can see two different contexts. I can see the basket with the products, and I can see the checkout with the summary and the, and the form of the card. So in order to do the basket, we need to do three tasks. Load the basket products, notify about the change, and show the products. So we're going to use a resolver. Whenever someone comes in on the route, we'll invoke the resolver. Then in, uh, the, this resolver is going to inject a load products command port, and its load product command may be containing information about the user or, or what kind of product should it load. That command port is going to get implemented by the product state. Finally, the product state will inject the DTO port, and it will have a product DTO array in form of observable. That DTO port is going to get implemented by HTTP product service. Pretty standard stuff. Now, the next we're going to have product context port, um, which will pr preserve the state of it. It might actually have a link to the product DTOs that we just fetched. And that's going to get implemented by in-memory product storage. And that's it. The next thing we have to do is to notify about the change. So what we have to do, create the event port. And that event port is going to get implemented by the product uh, event dispatcher. The next thing is to just show the product. So all this work we did, still you can't see anything. And then we go. We, we expose something called the product query port with optimized product query model. And that's going to get injected into the, into the product list component. And we're good to go. Let's talk about the checkout. How could you implement the checkout on the other side? Well, let's start with saving the product. So I am going to have an event listener that will listen to that event I just issued from the other library. And it's going to inject a change summary command port. I mean, now it's injected in the event listener, but you can connect the dots. You can use that port in so many other places, in, in the resolvers or in the components as well. And then that's going to get implemented by the checkout state. Finally, we're going to have a checkout uh, context port. We don't need the DTO. We don't fetch the data here. And then that's going to get implemented again by the in-memory storage. Finally, we want to show that summary. So what we're going to do, we're going to expose a summary query port with a summary query, which is optimized for this specific view. And that's going to get injected into the checkout component. And then we go. Things will start to work together. OK. Then the business comes in and says, we would like to actually add the remove feature, and it needs to react in the summary as well. No problem, because we already did the, all the hard work. So what we, all we have to do is to create a remove a product from the basket. So all we have to do is to do single port. Remove product command port, which will be implemented by the product state. And then the rest we can reuse. The product state will persist the new state in the context port. And then it will output a new event. And things will work for you. Let's zoom out. Let's see the coupling. The coupling. There is no coupling. There is coupling, obviously, with the event bus, but that's obvious. Like, we sometimes couple with the router. I mean, it's, it's, it's normal. So the idea is that the basket and the checkout don't know about each other. They know about the event being sent in between. That's pretty cool, because it's perfectly decoupled. And then, if you want to actually see this, or see me even coding that thing, it took about 40-something minutes. 
Uh, it's in the it's in the GitHub repo. Go to my GitHub and and, and Google for it, or go to the Logular and, and look for the video. It's already there as well. And then let's talk about the pros and cons. Let's start with the cons first. So over engineering, you know, Greg, it's over engineered, man. Like, you know, like why do I have to create 20 things? And I do agree with you. It is over engineered if you use simple stuff. If you're absolutely sure it's going to be simple. Now, this guy thought it's going to be simple. And this guy knew he needs to use the hexagonal architecture. It's pretty much the same functionality. It's very close. But the, the picture on your left is actually showing if you're not mindful from the start, mm, you're going to cause a lot of refactoring going forward. So I would say the picture on the left, on your left, is under-engineered comparing to the picture on the right. OK, how about the boilerplate to write? You know, you have to write those prints, uh, those ports, and you, know, you create those so many things. Again, I agree with you. Um, it is quite some things. If you don't follow the solid principles, I encourage you to actually learn about it. But if it's a boilerplate that really bothers you, we created something called a Logular plugin. Uh, you can see it on our stand. And it actually creates all the boilerplate for you, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about the constructor dependency, about the modules. You don't have to worry about the imports. Things just magically work. Our promise is that you will always have a working application. Just Google local documentation. I'm sure you're going to find it. OK, let's talk about the prawns real quick. It's maintainable because code is very structured. You saw it on the graphs. Then it's scalable because it's really easy to add the feature. Once you have all everything set up with the ports, it's easy to just add new functionality because things has its own place and it's very easy to just add it. Then it's also extensible. Maybe you want to move from HTTP to GraphQL. Nothing easy. You just replace the secondary adapter. The port stays the same. Uh, state stays the same. Maybe you want to change to another platform like the desktop or the mobile. You just change the primary adapters and the rest stays the same. Or maybe you want to go to another framework. That's also easy because the state is pretty much like a um, TypeScript file. So it's easy to just keep it the same and just change the platform. So it's very, very extensible. And then it's also testable. You can test things in isolations. And finally, it fosters the parallel development. You can have three developers working at the same time, one doing the primary adapters, one doing the state, and one doing the secondary adapters. All you have to agree is the, is the ports, right? And then it's self-contained and encapsulated. All the implementation details are hidden from you. All you have to know is what to invoke and, and pretty much just include the primary adapters in your code. And it's also encapsulated because you don't see what's really happening inside. And finally, we have a well-defined communication through the event. And last but not least, it's high cohesion and loose coupling, which you already saw many times. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if you like my talk, tweet about it, come to our stand. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs>